Good afternoon, greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon. We both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we are going to talk about housing affordability strains across the country. And it's a little better here than it is other places. Scripts every agent should know. Uh, and the renowned housing analyst who predicted the 2008 crash is going to weigh in on the current housing market. We've got it all covered here today. If you like what you hear, you get some value out of this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to schedule a call with our team or Sarah specifically, you can do that with the link in the comments. So housing affordability, this was pretty interesting. I think it was kind of a slow week for housing news. I mean, we didn't really hear a whole lot. I think most people were drinking spike seltzers down the shore, at yep. least at least uh, up here. It was kind of a quiet week. I mean, did you kind of feel the same way, Sarah? Yeah, last week was, was pretty quiet. And then what's interesting, <clears throat> just like this week so far, I've noticed an uptick in showings, in activity. Um, I think people are, people are back. Well, it, it, you know, that's a normal thing. And a lot of people freak out like when they, you know, four or five days go by and there's not a whole lot going on. But mm -hmm. you realize, especially the way the holidays hit uh, and Fourth of July debatably is a holiday. I mean, it's maybe like a hanging out holiday, not like mm -hmm. something like Christmas or. or, or but it, I feel like it's one that pe like people travel for it and you get off work yeah. and it's the summer and yeah, people do it. And we're in the Northeast where the weather is not this warm as it is, you know, most of mm -hmm. the year. So I, I, I do agree with you for sure. So. You know, there was kind of some some limited housing news, but what we saw happen was I, I think some bigger issues got brought up uh, by a lot of the folks we follow. So Lance Lambert talked about this. It was a Zillow study, um, and he analyzed the people that don't own properties right now. Zillow did the same thing. So non-homeowner families mm -hmm. um, that are, you know, the, the, how many of them are income ready to buy a home? I thought this was pretty interesting. So there's 52.3 million of the 134 million U.S. families reside in a home they don't own. So obviously that's, you know, not not the majority, but it's it's close to half. Right. So mm -hmm. whatever whatever that math is. And of those renter non homeowner households, only seven point nine million or 15.1 percent can afford to buy an average priced home in their local market, given current rates home prices and incomes uh, based on this analysis by Zillow. So does that number surprise you when you hear that first and foremost? Actually, a, it to some degree it does. I would have thought that that number would be a little bit higher. The 15.1 seems, um, seems a little low, but I mean, I guess that's the number. Well, and that's the average, right? So I'm going to give you the five markets with the lowest percentage of non-homeowners and then the five that are the highest, and we can talk about where Philadelphia fits into all this. So... The lowest, four of them are in California. I don't think that's a surprise at all. San Diego, 2.6%. San Jose, 2.7%. LA, 2.8%. San Francisco, 3.7%. So if you're worried about affordability, don't move to California. It's yeah, kind of I would say my, uh, I have a sister that lives in San Diego, rents, and I don't think would fall into the home buying category. So. Well, I mean, it, 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 and, you know, San Diego is a beautiful city. I mean, amazing place. But, I mean, the, these all these markets, they have really high price points. And yeah. then you've also got things like, the tax rate for the state and and other factors, which are really fortunate to Pennsylvania is not 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 horrible when it comes to that. So and then Salt Lake City, Utah is number five, which I found pretty interesting. Yeah, that's kind of wild. Uh, that's a real rapidly growing city right now. They just got an NHL franchise. Um, they had a Real Housewives franchise there, which you, you may laugh at, but like that is a big cult following. People talk about all the time. Yeah, I know you watch every week, Sarah. I'm sure. Oh, of right? course. So, <laughs> And um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's a very rapidly growing market for, for sure. So then there's the markets with the highest percentage of non-homeowner households who can afford to buy. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 25.6%. Detroit, Michigan, 23.1%. St. Louis, Missouri, 22.6%. Oklahoma City, 225 And Cleveland, Ohio at 22.4%. Any surprises there for you? Not really. I think those kind of track. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think they're, they're much more affordable cities, right? They're Midwestern cities. Um, you, you can def definitely get more bang for your buck there. So Philadelphia came in at uh, just above 17%, um, kind of above the, above the middle. And are you still seeing like affordability concern a lot of people? I guess that's my, my first question for you, because this is this issue is not going away. Prices are only going up. Rates have stabilized a little bit, but it's not like they've come down substantially. 
Yeah, I mean, although I think that for like uh, if there is like a, a large chunk there of people that know that they can't afford to buy a home and they've like run some basic numbers, mm-hmm. they don't even get to the point of like talking to us, right? Like you will come across some that like Good don't point. don't know and then you kind of like help work through that with them to find out if, you know, do expectations need to be adjusted or do you need to save more or do you need to stay at your job? Like, can you even actually do it right now or what steps can you take to put yourself in the best position to be able to do it down the line? Um, but I would say more often than not, by the time they get to having like serious conversations with me, they've at least run some basic numbers to where maybe you have to help guide them to something that mm-hmm. they um, will actually be able to get. But um, usually if they're willing to make adjustments, it, they're at least in the ballpark of being able to do something. Well, and I, I think that that's where proper planning really helps. That's a great point. And I, I think some people just know that there's no way they could afford right. it. And usually it's like a cash issue more times than, than an income issue. Now, mm-hmm. this is income uh, only is what they're talking about here. And when you look at this study from Zillow, what, what's interesting is that they, they put the median income for each city next to the uh, number of mortgage-ready households. And um, when you look at places like Philadelphia, like our, our, the median income that's coming in, um, the link's like right in the article, um, it's $106,000. That's the median household income. So that's a couple people. That's on the higher end. You're only seeing places like Connecticut, uh, Hartford, Connecticut's 112, Baltimore, Maryland's 112, Washington, D.C.'s 129. Um, I mean, you're not seeing a lot of places that have a much bigger number. I mean, San Francisco's 144. Uh, I mean, Wait, what was Philly's number? 106, $106,000, okay. which, which, which makes sense. And then yeah. you see San Jose at 167. Those are up in that, like, that tech area up in. Uh, that, uh, that part of Northern California there, but you go to some of these other places where they're, I mean, San Diego has a, a lower median family income than Philadelphia. It's 105,000. Okay. LA's at 99,000. So the fact that you have real estate prices being so high there and the median income is basically the same as where we are here. Right. I think that, that you know, it's, it's important to acknowledge that the market's not as bad here as some people think. Mm-hmm. And I, I think this is, this is pretty interesting data because a lot of people don't realize what they can afford and they, they may need to, have you ever run into that where like a buyer was surprised they could afford a home or maybe someone who was thinking about renting turned into buying something? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us more. How, how'd that, how'd that, how'd that play out? Um, you know, I think that you just like have an idea of, you know, what your finances are. And then, um, I guess once you actually like dig into it or if they were in a position where they could get some, if down payment money was the problem, being able to get gift money from Mm -hmm. family or, you know, if it's just like a couple loose ends that are keeping them from being able to, to get there. Um, But, you know, also if you look at um, different areas where the, your taxes might be lower and then you can Mm -hmm. factor it when you break it down into the monthly payment, it's not uncommon to be able to, pay your mortgage and for what, for less or equal to what you were paying rent for. So then at that point, it's just like, can we make the down payment work? Um, and yeah, I've definitely had people that were, were surprised or when rates were a little bit more volatile, uh, you know, if there was that like dip, like, all right, here you yeah, go. <laughs> it's time, right? And it's interesting you bring up the taxes because California had the four out of the top five. They reassess every time. A home is sold in California. That means oh, the really? taxes go up. Yeah. Um, Philadelphia does. The, they reassess every year, but it's been a mild reassessment. The suburban counties here, besides Delaware County, have not reassessed at all for the past couple decades. So, you know, th- there's that opportunity to buy maybe like an older home with lower taxes. Like we always see that new mm-hmm. construction has really high taxes. So that could be another re- another factor here. And this is stuff that it's important to understand because it affects your payment. That's how people yeah. shop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the... It's wild how you could be just, you know, a mile. um, You could compare two different houses that are a mile apart. And if they fall into different um, tax categories, I mean, the monthly payments can be Mm -hmm. wildly different. Well, think about like being on the edge of Delaware County versus like Montgomery County or Mm -hmm. Delaware County and Chester County. I mean, you see those taxes jump up pretty substantially. And then you have to look at like what's in the community. So Upper Marion Township, they got the King of Prussia Mall. Mm -hmm. You know who pays the most of the taxes? The King of Prussia Mall, not not the people in Upper Marion. And then you see other places um, that are you know close to there. And, and Wayne's a very interesting zip code because it's in Montgomery County, Chester County, 
Delaware. And Delaware County. Yep. You live in Wayne, right? So yeah. the portion that's in Delaware County has the highest taxes because it's yeah. a different school district. It's a different tax rate. The upper Marion portion is the smallest, but they got the best taxes. And then mm-hmm. you got what's in Chester County, which is a lot more palatable for people. So that, that that's a really great point you bring up. Yeah. Do you see buyers focusing on taxes a lot and property tax? Do they even know what they're looking at? Or they just tell you the areas they like. Usually it starts with just <clears throat> saying the areas that they like, but then depending on like if there is flexibility for them or not, once you point out the difference in taxes, then, you know, certainly it's something that they like pay attention to. Well, then I think that's probably you being a good real estate agent as well. So, you know, that that's one factor. We've talked about what's going on in the insurance markets. What's happening now when we talk about this affordability and, you know, this uh, housing affordability has not, we, we had this presidential debate a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you, you caught that at all. I did. A lot, lot to talk about in the debate. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. They mentioned housing once in the entire debate. And it was about some plan that wasn't really, wasn't very baked. Like I didn't, I didn't hear a lot of details about it. We're going to add 2 million homes. We're going to bring down the cost of housing. I don't know how you do those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just me. Um, that's what one of the candidates said. And when you look at the top issue for Gen Z voters is housing affordability. This is uh, based on um, a report that was released by Redfin at the beginning of June. It's a key factor for Gen Z voters when deciding who to vote for um, because one, they don't own a lot of property. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, and then secondly, um, it's that, you know, Gen Z, Gen Xers and baby boomers, you know, they, they didn't feel that way because they own a lot of real estate. So right. it's obviously on the voters' minds. And what age is a Gen Zer? So let's go to the, the web for this because I think it, it can, it's like, there's like a range. It's not always the case. Um, so a Gen Z, uh, person would be, um, born between 1997 and 2012, making them between 12 and 27 years old. So that's, you know, I mean, obviously a 12 year old's not buying a house. My son's 11. That'd be crazy. <laughs> buying a hat. I'm like, see you guys. I'm out. Like, what, what would you do? But the people in their early 20s, I mean, I, I bought my first house when I was 23 years old. So I, I can understand that. Some people want to do that right away. Um, and then you've got, there's a whole chart here, right? So then you have the folks that are, um, uh, you know, millennials, they're considered born in like the early 80s. I've seen anywhere from like 1980 to like 1984 up into the, the mid to late 90s. Um, and then you have, you know, Gen Xers, 1965 to any to, you know, the, the, the early 1980s and then baby boomers, which are 46 to 64, 65. So like those generations, like X and baby boomers, they don't have really have anything to worry about. Most of them right. own properties at this point. Um, and, you know, even millennials. I mean, some of them, I mean, I think they, they've kind of gotten in, but the, the younger millennials, I think are in a tougher spot because they're in like yeah. their late twenties, early thirties. So, yep. um, it's, but that, that, and that, that's a real issue right now. I, I don't, I don't think enough, uh, is being talked about in the election, unfortunately. And now the, obviously the headlines are being dominated by something totally different. So mm-hmm. this seems to be a, a big problem and housing affordability is on the mind of a lot of folks. So, um, I mean, a lot of them feel like it's like something important for a lot of Americans. It's kind of the American dream in a lot of ways. Right. Which is becoming harder and harder to attain. <laughs> sure. And, you know, what, what, what also was uh, released in this survey is they do care about other political issues. Uh, but housing is, is, is like the biggest one because it affects them. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I don't really know how you fix that besides building more. Pro- I, like, I like the idea of building more properties. Like if they talked about what was in the debate, there w- I'll give you the the talking points here. Let me pull this up because I think it's important to kind of acknowledge that here. I'm going to go to the abridged version because the debate was a disaster. Yeah. I didn't catch the whole thing. Maddie like was having a night that night. It's huh. taking her a long time to go to bed. I was watching the highlights because uh, I was, my, was my, my son, my son Leo threw out the first pitch at the Phillies game that night, which was awesome. Yeah. So I got, Saw by the that. time we got home, it was very cool. I felt like a really good dad that day. That was, uh, yeah. that was nice. <laughs> But uh, so we got we got in late and I saw the highlights. Um, so here's what it said. Um, it came right at the 315 mark of the debate. And there, there was some nonsense the president said. And he said, we're going to make sure we reduce the price of housing. We're going to make sure we build two million new units. And we're going to make sure we cap rents so corporate greed doesn't take over. I mean, I, I, it's not much of a plan. That's the no. problem. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they're not talking about it more. Yeah, or I know this isn't anything that was brought up in the debate, but uh, a while back when we were talking about possible solutions and one of them being if you do have, like, to 
unlock things and mm-hmm. which we're not seeing as much of the seller lock in effect, but it still is there. It's, it's like, definitely it's there. Like absolutely there. Um, having that rate move with them to being able to keep your rate when you move to something else, I feel like that could loosen things up a bit. Yeah, I mean, the, the, or just even loosening up the local uh, building codes because, I mean, mm-hmm. new construction has so many incentives when you go by there. Like, they'll always give you, like, a buy down on the rate. Yep. Like, the, you know, they're, they're willing to work with you a lot more. And you look at some of the local zoning codes. I mean, in Chester County specifically, they have, like, minimum lot sizes of two acres. Like, that's just yeah. impossible to do. De- and I'm not saying develop all those areas, but there there could be some exceptions made or, you know, it's like a mixed-use property. Like, those things are very popular. You look at the mm-hmm. town center in King of Prussia. Yep. They built all those properties there. And they sold them all. Like, mm-hmm. they're, they're all sold. And, yeah. you know, that's been, all of a sudden, King of Prussia is like this, like, booming metropolis. Remember when King of Prussia was, like, 20, 30 years ago? It was nothing like this. I mean, it was just, like, the mall, and that was it. So yeah. it's, it's definitely brought a little more of a, of a, a community to, to the area, for sure. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't see this going away. I mean, and you don't see the candidates really talking about anything. I don't, I don't think they're going to be saying anything anytime soon. I mean, I think right now it's, like, damage control mode. So um, yeah. <laughs> for all the things we know went on. So the good news here is for people looking in the greater Philadelphia area, the, the market is a lot more palatable here. And I think that's the thing to realize. And if you're struggling to find what you want from an affordability standpoint, what are some of the solutions you give the buyers? I mean, I've got a couple here, but what, what are some of the things you, you kind of coach them on so they can kind of see what else is out there? So I guess one of the first things that I suggest is to um, make sure that they are having the conversations with their lender um, and finding out what all options are available to them because there are different packages, different loan programs, different things that can be added to another type of loan that uh, can kind of, you know, make things Mm -hmm. come together for them. Um, And then, you know, just kind of focusing on the month, like where realistically can you be at for the monthly payment? Is there another source of uh, or another place that you can go to for additional down payment mm-hmm. money if that is, and that's not going to be an option for everybody. But, um, you know, if you could get, it doesn't have to necessarily be like this massive, massive check, like a couple, um, like a couple thousand dollars could, you know, really mm-hmm. put you over the the line there to, to make everything come together. Um, and then I guess from there, kind of focusing on what wiggle room do you have in terms of location, in terms of the condition of the property, and then looking for properties that you would potentially have the most um, room to negotiate. And Mm -hmm. usually that's going to come from something that's been on the market for a little bit. Took the words right out of my mouth. Adjacent neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking about this today, and this I'd be interested to get your perspective. Before you started selling real estate, did you have any idea that half of these towns and neighborhoods exist that you have now sold homes in? No. And I think that that's what people don't realize. They operate in their, I don't want to say bubble, but their community, right? Yeah. You move to an area to stay there. Yeah. And I'm talking about people with like family and kids. And I, I was with a friend of mine uh, one time we were going, I forget where we were going. And uh, I'm driving there and he, he's from Wayne. Mm-hmm. He lives in Berwyn. And we were in Havertown. He goes, I've never been here before. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And, and, but yeah. it's like, you don't, you don't get it. Right. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that's a, that's a really great point exploring the adjacent neighborhoods. Yeah. And that's where a good agent can show you that. Well, and what also is funny is even like, like homes right by me, like there are streets so close to me that I've just never driven down before. And there are like entire, I don't know, neighborhoods and communities and like all of this stuff that's going on. And I've just like never turned down that road. Um, so yeah, like be resourceful, I guess. Well, that's really well said. And, and I I think it's, you know, people just don't get it. Right. And, and you may not know this, like it's five minutes from where you want to be. We were we had moved a couple of years ago when our uh, one of our kids' friends came over. He's like, I never knew this was back here. Yeah. They go they go to the same elementary school that's walking distance from our house. Like, right. I mean, and, and so I think that's a really important factor to look at here. And what you also talked about was like targeting homes that have been on the market. Like that that's the opportunity in the marketplace right now. Anything that's been on the market more than ten days, if you're on the edge of affordability, go check those homes out because th- th- there's an opportunity to make an offer there for sure. Right, and I guess like if your initial conversation is like it has to be this, 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 and this, and either none of those things are coming up on the market or you're going to them and losing out and you're putting in the best offer you can, but you're not able to get your offer accepted. Um, A lot of times at the beginning of a home search, like you think that I I need all of these things and don't be afraid to reintroduce or like bring in a property that doesn't hit all those things. And like,
quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the scripts every agent should know and then what scripts Sarah and I would maybe supplement here next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. For the best local mortgage service and great rates on your money, look no further than Mortgage America. We've been operating in the greater Philadelphia area for 40 years with a focus on smooth, easy access to home purchasing. Whether you're a first-time buyer, upsizing or downsizing, or just refinancing, we have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and access to subsidized interest rates. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. To learn more, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. We always have a person available to take your call with around-the-clock human service. Purchase your home with the personalized local service you find at Mortgage America. Mortgage America is an equal housing lender. NMLS 128501. The Tom Tool Sales Group is the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania with over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows Greater Philly better than we do. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. We hire the best agents and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Main Line at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's Tom, Tool with an E, dot com. Sell your home for more and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line. When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low-down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. Mortgage America is a deposit under one Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Timon. And we both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Main Line, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we're going to be talking about the scripts every agent should know. I thought this was an interesting article, but I don't agree with the whole thing. So make sure to tune in and listen to the ones you should be implementing based on this article that came up on housing wire. And we're also going to be talking about realtor.com and homes.com getting into a lawsuit. We just kind of had to ad lib here. It's really a live show. Everyone can see that. So we're going to be talking about that at the end here. Interesting stuff going on there with some false advertising claims. So I I saw this article, Sarah, um, it was written by uh, Ashley Harwood from uh, she writes for housing wire and it was about scripts Every agent should know. It was called 12 Proven Real Estate Scripts That Boost Business Confidence and Earn More Business. I was a little surprised that there was as many objection handlers in here because that's not really a script. That's more of a strategy in the script. So Mm -hmm. before we get into this, and then we'll kind of go through each one of these here. When when you hear script, how would you define a script? So I would say it's a... um, it's more than just like a bullet point guideline. It's uh, certain keywords that you want to hit, uh, certain things that you're listening for, and a way to kind of control and guide the conversation. So I like that you said guide the conversation and control it because you know how you do that? You ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. To me, a a script is a series of questions to get more information, to kind of see if this person's even thinking about transacting. I mean, how many times you had like a lead come to you and like you call them right away and they're like, oh, we're not looking. And, and like, they really mean it. It's not a defense mechanism. Yeah. I don't think folks get that the goal of like scripting and dialogues is uncovering what's actually going on. Right. And it's not like some magical thing you or I would say that just suddenly someone buys a house. That's not how right. this works. Right. So yeah, it's, uh, it's really kind of geared towards 
yeah, getting what the actual picture is of what is going on so that you can either help them or move along. 100%. And I think that that's a, that's a great way to, and or, you know, maybe help them long-term, right? Yeah, like a lot yeah. of follow-up, that, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. So here were the 12 scripts listed, and, and I'm just going to go through them. Tell me what you think of when you hear these. And then I came up with a list that I, I, I would suggest are probably more important. So first, expired listing cold calling script. That makes me think of Tom Tool. Well, thank you. I, I didn't write the article, but uh, I, and look, that's got a high degree of difficulty to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, there, and there's very few expired listings right now. Mm-hmm. I was surprised that was number one. Now, if you're in Florida, it might be a different story. Sure. So that was one. And, and, and I would say it's one of the more difficult scripts because you're dealing with someone that's mad, that's upset, like things didn't go well, their home didn't sell. I don't care what anyone says. Like it's a, it's a bad situation. Mm-hmm. So a good one to have. I don't know if that would be number one. Number two, FISBO cold calling script. Yeah. So the, like, I think this is also one that you need a certain, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to provide all of the stats and give them the information as to why it's worth taking a meeting with you. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't done a ton of just like calling FISBOs to try and get the listing. Where I've had success with FISBOs is when I had a client who was interested in the house and then being able to, um, you know, work with, like represent the buyer and have the seller pay a commission. I think that's a great point um, that, you know, again, this isn't going to be for everybody. I mean, calling for sale by owners, 30% of them don't even want to talk to a real estate agent. They're never going to list. And there's like 71% that list in 62 days or less. So it's, it it can, it can be challenging, but again, there's not a lot of these because these homes are selling right now. Like Mm -hmm. that, that's the reality. So those are the first two. Then there was a bunch of objection handlers. So seller objection script, and they had a couple. One's the other agent said they can get us more money. Two, will you reduce your commission? Three um, was a buyer objection. We're just going to work directly with the listing agent. We don't need you. W- what do you think about those? Um, yeah, I mean, those are all things that that come up and being able to know what to say is important. So, I mean, I think like we do have scripts for those. And and that's, not, that's an objection handler. That's not yeah. like a script because right. you're not, all you're doing is combating a, a belief or a question that somebody has. And combat's not even the right word. You're like, they're thinking about doing business and they got some concerns. To me, that's not a script. I mean, that, that, that's an objection handler. So mm-hmm. um, door knocking around a just sold listing. You've done a lot of this. Mm-hmm. What do you think about this one? Um, so I, I mean, I guess I do it like, it's not really a script though. Like you have, you have to come with uh, information, something mm-hmm. to like give them. Um, and that, I feel like that one's more conversational. Yeah. So, and see, I actually disagree with you because I think that's exactly what a script is. So like when you would knock on a door, you've done, I've, I've done this with you. Like mm-hmm. what, what was your, what do you say? You're knocking on the door of my house. You don't know me. Right. So the first thing that I always want to do after I knock on the door is step back so that you're not like very smart, you know, right up in there whenever they open the door. And ah, like, yeah, <laughs> just, <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, boo. And then uh, you want to be friendly. <laughs> you want to be polite. And you want to um, have them let their guard down by saying, like, I'm not trying to have you sell your house. And Mm -hmm. just say, like, what you're doing there. And then um, generally the way that that we do it is, you know, say, like, hey, have you heard any friends or have you heard any of your neighbors mentioning anything? Um, Just because it takes a little bit of the – because the first thing that they always say is, I'm not selling. Like, even before you – are able to start talking to them. So you want to get past that to be able to just like have a conversation with, uh, without them, you know, having their guard super high up. Sure. And I think that, and, and th- there's probably some questions you can ask there. Like, Hey, do you know about any neighbors that are thinking about moving? Mm-hmm. Like th- th- there is a scripting portion to that. Now yeah. there is the physical component too. Like stepping back from the door is probably one of the smartest things you can do. Yeah. All kidding aside, imagine like someone comes to your door. Some people don't even answer the door. They're like, why oh, are you yeah. knocking at the door? So that, that's and and you could probably use that script if you're like circle dialing. I think that's a that it's it's kind of the same script. Um, it's a, a little different, obviously, when you're on the phone. So that one I I, I could see because I, I do, I'm a big believer in leveraging your sales, especially if you're doing like an open house or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, number seven, when a family member or friend hires another agent, I think that's an objection handler again. Mm-hmm. Asking your sphere for referrals. What do you think about this one? Um. Yeah, I guess that would be a script. 
I, I, I would call that the Ford script where yeah. it's instead of like, the, the, and where you're asking like, hey, so how's your family doing? Like, how's your daughter? Mm-hmm. How's your husband? Hey, how's the work environment been for you? Um, doing anything fun for the summer? Like th- those, those are questions you want to ask where they're, it's, you don't want to be too salesy with these people because you just come out and say, hey, who do you know that's looking to buy? It's like, I would just hang up on that person. That's all they're right. calling for. So um, now, so I, I do, I, I am a big believer that um, asking your sphere for referrals, that's an important script. You probably need to do it. Most agents never call their sphere or never right. talk to them. And that, that's a big mistake because you're very referable after you sell someone a house. And then when they forget about you, it kind of changes a little bit. Right. Finding buyer leads at open houses. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that there is like a little bit of a, uh, yeah, there's a script involved for that Th- one. This is kind of like the door knocking script because it's like a lot of people think of scripts over the phone. But if you're not asking the right questions, these people come, they're coming into a house you're selling. Yeah. Like everyone kind of knows what's going on here. Like there's a game plan. So, you know, now I don't agree with some of the questions. Like, do you already have a buyer's agent? To me, that's a horrible question. Right. So how, how have you been looking for homes so far? Tell me about your home search. What have you done? Um, that, that to me are the kind of questions you want to ask. And then you probably go into more like LP mama stuff than anything right. else. Like, well, and then this also is kind of twofold because it is, yes, like finding out about the buyer so that maybe you will be able to represent them in a transaction, but also that you can give more detailed feedback to your seller for what happened at the open house. Cause there is always an expectation I feel like going into it of like you're going to have some neighbors you're going to mm-hmm. have some people that are just like check it out you're going to have some people that are at the beginning of the home search but you're also you know going to have some people who just like doing open houses and do have an agent mm-hmm. or are ready to transact are do have their ducks in a row like it can and so being able to kind of give some sort of a breakdown um more than just 17 people through uh so that they yeah. kind of know what to expect out of it is helpful. One of the worst things an agent can do is not call the seller and let them know what's going on after the open house. Like right. that, that just ticks people off. Like you just had, you had to go out of the house on a Saturday or Sunday. Mm-hmm. Typically you're ruining your day yeah. because selling your house kind of sucks. And yeah. it, it, if you're not doing that, like you do want to get some feedback and that's a great way to engage. Hey, what didn't you like about this home, Sarah? Right. What did you like? Hey, if I found another home that had these things and didn't have this, would you want to know about it? Like th- yeah. those are, those are the kind of scripting questions you want to ask there. So I, I like that one. I think that's really important. And it also gets you in the arena as an agent. Like you're, mm-hmm. you're in there in front of people. Yep. Closing script for the listing agreement. Um, let me see what this says. Yeah, I mean, I think there will, yeah, there is, you want to, you want them to sign the agreement. <laughs> so I, there are I agree with this. You need to, yeah. I've talked to a lot of agents. They're like, the appointment ends and I just thank them. And I'm like, if you go there and you give this, we've been on many listing appointments. You give this mm-hmm. presentation. Everything sounds good. And you don't ask for the business. Like, I, what are you doing? I mean, right. it, it's, you've got to ask. And I think a lot of people are afraid. They're like, I don't want to come off salesy. It's like, well, great. Then you're not going to sell anything if you don't ask. I mean, that's kind of right. like the alternative. So. Well, because there may be some people that are like waiting for you to, they're waiting to hear what the next step is. And then you're just like, all right, bye. And they're like, well, what do we do? <laughs> yeah. Know? And. Well, that, that, that's actually really great that you said the next step. That's a good Phil Jones magic word sprinkling like, hey, Sarah, so here's what happens next. So right. if you want to get started, we can sign the paperwork now and then we determine when you want to hit the market. And right. Like, or hey, like if they have, like oftentimes it'll be like, all right, I want to, you know, be, as you're going through kind of like the timelines for what, how much time we need to get things ready or knowing the condition of the home, like getting the stagers out there, blah, 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 like we can't do any of that until mm-hmm. we can't schedule the photographer. We can't get the staging person out here. We can't do any of that until we've like buttoned this up. So, um, you know, and kind of reiterating, like none of this starts until this piece yes. happens. Um, Cause sometimes they're like, okay, yeah, well then let's go. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and I think that's, that's, you got to ask, like yeah. you're not doing your job as a salesperson. If you're not asking for the business like that, that's something like people expect it. Like they called you out to their home. Mm-hmm to look at it, give them a price and talk to them about moving. Yeah. And you're like, all right, here's your price. See you later. Like that tells me you don't want the business if someone acted like that. Right. So I, I do like that one. Um, asking for a price adjustment on stale listings. What do you think about this one? Um, I mean, I is that a script? Like There, there are scripting elements to scripting, it for yeah. sure. Um, I think it's, you got to have a conversation. But to me, sometimes it's like, you know what the call's about. You're calling the seller over explaining does right. not help anybody. So it might be as simple as, 
Hey, so so given everything going on in the market and the lack of a written reaction from a buyer, I'm clear we need to go to X on the price mm-hmm. and then just stop talking. Like that's a script. Like that yeah. that's that's one that's worked for me pretty pretty well. But and there's a lot of things you got to kind of say over and over again. Like, yeah. like you know the market's telling us something, whatever it is. Here's the feedback. So. I do agree on that one. Agents that can't have that conversation, like it, it, you just put yourself in a bad spot. Right. Well, and it makes it uh, a little bit easier if there is feedback coming in and consistently it's mm-hmm. too too high, too high, too high, you know. Here's the last one that they came up with, and then we'll talk about what, what we're thinking we need to do here. So taking a vacation, that script. Mm-hmm. This looks like an auto email responder to me or like a mass email that yeah, goes that out to somebody. That's not a script, is it? I'm heading out. Um, no, I mean I think that's like looks like an it looks like an email responder. Right. I don't think that's a script. I, I totally agree. So there was a lot that was missed here. So let me fire off some of these at you. LP mama. Like where's that at? I think that's something every agent needs to know. Yeah. What does that stand for, Sarah? Pop quiz. Location, price, motivation, appointment. Meh meh meh. Uh. <laughs> mortgage and approval. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> you, you, you will do all this stuff. It's, uh, you're, you're such a faker. Um, so LP Mama is really important. Like, that's what you need to know. Um, ALM, appointment, location, motivation. motivation. That, that's a shorter one for setting appointments with buyers. ATM, appointment, time frame, motivation for sellers. We talked about the Ford script. And then I, I'm a big believer, and you've adopted this. Like, I've seen you on listing appointments where that whole thing should be scripted. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't know exactly what you're going to say walking in there and like have the presentation down. Right. You ever seen like a speaker recently? Um, no. <laughs> like went to somebody who was yeah, like, like, a, or like, like a, in any, anyone. I mean, you've seen speakers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen speakers. Could before. you tell the speaker that didn't have their presentation down versus the ones that did? Yeah. That's what you're doing at a listing presentation. Yeah. I think it's the same thing. The buyer appointment should be scripted. We talked about price adjustments. I would like to see some more tactical stuff in there. Um, and, you know, I think there's, you know, the scripts for a lead that comes in on your website. Like, how do you talk to them? How do you, how, what's your professional greeting sound like? Like, those are things that I think would be important. But some of these more tactical ones so you can uncover the motivation, that's really the most important thing when it comes to scripting. Yeah. Anything you want to add? Not really. I mean, I think it's just, yeah, really making sure to get out of the conversation, the pieces of information that you need to be able to know what to do next or how to, how to best help them. Okay. I agree. I, I think that's all it is. It's like guidance and, and, and that's really it. So good stuff, Sarah. I think there's some objection handlers in there. The article is pretty good though. I think yeah. it's just maybe, you know, maybe, maybe a, a tweaking of scripting patterns or, or like uh, tools you need in your tool belt, whatever you're going to call it. So We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about this Realtor.com and Homes standoff that is escalating to the courts. More court battles in real estate sounds like fun. We'll discuss it next on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. You shouldn't have to deal with all the red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or online bank. At Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and detailed service of a local bank. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast settlements, low down payment options, and first-time homebuyer programs. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. For more information, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. Mortgage America is have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline. I'm Tom Tool of the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline. If you're thinking of becoming a real estate agent in the greater Philly area, I have a special offer for you. Our team did $165 million of volume in 2021, making us the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania and a top 1% team nationally. Our agents love us because we offer them a successful career, a great life, and an unbeatable culture. Agents who've been with us for at least a year average 30-plus sales. Even our brand new agents average 17 to 24 sales a year. We offer proven systems and expert training. We help you set more appointments and sell more houses. Now here's the offer. If you don't have a real estate license yet, we offer real estate scholarships so you can get one for free. Check it out at realestatescholarshipprogram.com 
or visit the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline at TomTool.com. That's Tom Tool with an E dot com. Get more out of your real estate career and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low-down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. All right, all right. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time, and we both work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we are talking about this realtor.com parent company's Move Inc., they're suing CoStar, the parent company of Homes.com, over the alleged theft of portal data and documents. So this was all filed last week, um, and that their move uh, alleges that there's a former employee who now works for CoStar. This person's name is James Kaminsky. Stole trade secrets to help fuel the rapid growth of Homes.com. Uh, the complaint states there's nothing wrong with lawful, even intense competition. But competitors should never be allowed to cheat and steal to go ahead. Uh, the uh, alleged allegations against Kaminsky are that he accessed realorder.com documents through June of this year without being detected, despite leaving the firm in January. Sounds like some bad business practices there. Yeah. And uh, joining CoStar in March. And according to the complaint, uh, James Kaminsky accessed information from realorder.com 37 times after CoStar hired him, violating federal and state computer fraud laws to do so. That's a lot of times. Yeah, wait, so what was he, like, we don't know what he was taking. So the documents that they claimed he took included information about content planned for realorder.com, ideas for stories, metrics showing user traffic, a list of contacts, lists of realorder.com employees and their compensation, and other private business information. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's definitely illegal if that yeah. happens. Like, I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm not an attorney. I don't think but you right. are either. But no, no, I'm not. That's pretty, that's pretty clear. So right. he worked for realorder.com for nine years. Um, had, so heading, what, they just never like canceled his access to anything? Like that seems kind of like maybe they should have. See, that's a bad that. business move. I right. said that earlier because I mean, anytime someone leaves a company, there's got to be like a protocol yeah. of what to do, um, no matter what it is, because you don't know where they're going. And, you know, we, we have, you know, most companies have like confidentiality agreements about what they're doing. And especially if they go work at a, at a, um, a competitor, that's just a bad business model. I don't know. Right. I mean, yeah, like especially if they were continuing to go in and access that many times after having left the company. Because I mean, I feel like if somebody is kind of being sneaky before they leave, that would be a little bit harder to like maybe track or mm-hmm. stop. I don't know. But like I would I would just assume that at the as soon as you quit a job or you're fired, that like you can no longer log in and access your stuff. I mean, that, that, that's a normal say. thing in yeah. business. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've been to like Zillow headquarters and you got to sign like an NDA walking in the door there. Yeah. Like, you can't take photos. Like there was all sorts of stuff going on. Like, I mean, it was, it was this was years ago, right before we got our flex uh, partnership. And it, I'm like signing this and I'm like, I'm not even going to read this. I'm just like, it was like yeah. 10 pages. I'm just like, all right, just tell me what to do. Yeah. I'm not going to cause a problem. So as he departed, apparently he sent all this information to his personal email account on the last day he had access to Move's computer system. Okay. Um, and then he established some sort of undetected ongoing access to allow himself to spy on the highly confidential documents stored on protected computer systems. Sneaky. I mean, th- th- this is not not good. Um, and, you know, the, this is the latest development in, like, this rivalry between these two companies. So we had the chance to interview the CEO of Realtor.com, Damian Eels, on uh, Knowledge Brokers. And, I mean... He is not a fan of homes.com and he thinks their whole, their whole traffic, uh, the way they put it out there. We talked about it on the show. It was, uh, it, it's misleading to say the least. Like he's putting in like apartments.com and all these other websites mm-hmm. that are there. So, I mean, there's been a long running feud here and unfortunately it like went to this level. I mean, so what do you think about that? I mean, I think this is kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, if like, he's probably in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I agree with that. <laughs> Um, and well, I guess hopefully it'll make them, uh, tighten up their 
you know, sometimes it's like somebody needs to do something for like a protocol to be put in place. I'm mm-hmm. guessing they will uh, have stricter or like tighter security or something yeah. on their their systems to uh, try to prevent that from happening again. See, see the, I, well, I mean, that, that, that should happen for sure. I mean, there should be like anytime someone leaves a company, there should be like an offboarding checklist. That's just mm-hmm. proper business. With this, um, I mean, this feud's been going on, and what I, what I get concerned about is that anytime you're like worried about what the competitor's doing, you know what that's stopping you from doing? Right, like executing doing on your, your own business. Stuff, yes, yeah. exactly. So I think it's uh, that that that's part of a challenge here. And the legal complaint reiterated many of the arguments that Realorder.com has, which is um, that the uh, Homes.com has false claims around their traffic's and impressions. They don't use the same sort of reporting system. It's a, it's a whole thing. So. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, and, and they go on to say, according to every independent third party source, Move can identify Realtor.com has for years been the second most visited register. Other as to who is number two, mm-hmm. but what does the for actual site traffic or is that part of the debate that they are like sourcing their numbers differently to make themselves look like they are doing better than they are? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what they're what they're doing is they 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 have all these different websites. So yeah. it's homes.com is the real estate. So that that's the most comparable. To- oh, and they're saying you're adding in apartments.com and all these other things to like yes. make your uh, numbers go up. Yeah, that that's what it is. Because I mean, the yeah, they're right on like Inman News, and it says like we get X, like millions of hits a month and all this other stuff. And you know, they had to read the fine print. Do they have a little asterisk under it saying uh, <laughs> this it, this is compiled from this site, this site, this site, this site. I mean, it 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 does say it's from the family of websites, so that's yeah. kind of the the way it works. Um, and just today, CoStar pulled two Homes dot com ads after. Move challenged their traffic numbers, um, and you know it was uh, the 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 two challenges were brought by uh, Move dot com, um, and it's, it's so they, they they pulled the ads, and uh, it's you know apparently CoStar uses Google Analytics, the other one uses Comstar, so it's I mean you're not comparing apples to apples, which I kind of get. Yeah, the fact that they pulled the ads, I mean, so what you probably don't know is homes.com. Like they are like pitching every real estate agent. that They came into the office to meet with me mm-hmm. and I said, great, show me your data. And then they didn't, they didn't really have a lot to say. Yeah. Um, we do business with realorder.com and you know, the, the, the quality of leads there is, is strong. So, I mean, uh, we, we've converted, you know, a number of sales from that. So that's obviously a lot better. Um, so that, I mean, and they have homes.com has 16 different URLs. So they got apartments.com, apartment finder, finder sites, apartment, home living. You get a lot of, like, have you ever taken a rental listing and just get bombarded with with leads that come in on that? Yeah, it's been a while, but... Uh, that's a smart yeah. <laughs> business move on your part because we're a sales group, not a rental group, but that's a right. whole other story. But uh, they have all these other websites, which is what they're talking about here, and, and it's the, the 156 million audience that they quote is all those websites, not just homes.com. And is, like, the whole point that anybody would even care about this if you're, like, a real estate agent for whether or not you're going to, like, buy into them yeah well i mean i i cared i mean yeah. uh, you know for our i mean you know and, and they're, they're they're not selling you leads right so realorder.com will say you're gonna get between this many and this many leads yeah. and they they almost always deliver homes.com says you're getting impressions and it's up to you and then because our team does a lot of business we'd have to have a higher bill because it's they have this your listing your lead sort of thing where okay. like you take a listing in wherever the lead comes to the listing agent not the person that's advertising so gotcha but, uh, I mean, if you're fluffing the traffic up right. and then you're not delivering on the leads, guess what's going to happen? Well, I mean, you can only do that for so long well, before, yeah, like, it's point. not going to, um, at the end of the day, like, eventually the smoke screen will clear and uh, that's not a good long-term plan. I, I, <laughs> or it's not a good short-term plan either, but, like, uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with you, and I think that's the challenge here is that there's, 
if that's what they're actually doing, and th- and obviously they pulled the ads for a reason. I think that's very telling. Mm-hmm. And I've spoken to Damien about that. I mean, he was, if you, if you check out the Knowledge Brokers podcast we did with him, I mean, he was adamant. I mean, it was. Uh, what was the ad? Them saying we're number two? Um, so they have, let me see if they have this on. I can pull it up. Where if they, they say they have 100. Oh, just like saying their numbers of traffic. Gotcha. Yeah, it says they have 156 million unique visitors monthly on their site and has doubled the unique monthly visitors of realorder.com. But, um, you know, it, again, it's, it's the network. They call it the network, not the actual not the actual homes.com website because they have all these apartment things, which, which, I mean, do you want rental leads? I would not pay for rental leads. So the fact that they pulled the ads is pretty interesting. Um, I thought that was that, I mean, that's pretty telling. So, um, and uh, I mean, Damian Niels, he says that it's uh, homes.com's smoke and mirrors. That's what he said and quoted that to Inman. So, and that they've misled a lot of customers while realtor.com has remained focused on growing. So th- this is really interesting to me. I don't think we're going to see the end of this. I mean, these two companies really got it out for each other. I caution them for what we said, though, because if you really want to execute on your business, like you can't worry about this noise. Right. Well, and that's what I was just going to say. Like, well, if you're in one of the like and clearly like they have a feud going on. So you're going to want to like point out all the errors that the other guy is making. And if they're making, you know, false claims and like if that's like impacting your business negatively, you're going to want to like point mm-hmm. those things out. But if you just kind of rise above to some degree and keep building yours and make yours an even better product that people go to, like, that's ultimately going to be, you know, what's going to work. I mean, I, I agree. And I, I, but then there's like the other side of this. Someone's saying like something that's totally false. Like, I, I can see why they have a problem with it. Oh, I mean, yeah. this is, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars here. And, you know, that's no different than saying, hey, here's the, comp plan over at this company is just wildly inaccurate. And that's right. what people start saying, which, I mean, you know, and look, that stuff's happened to me before. I mean, people are just, mm-hmm. like, it's just like, what are we talking about here? And it's just not accurate. So I, I kind of get it. Well, I, it would be nice if they, like, rather than having to try to decipher what is what, if they would just use the same, because uh, wait, I didn't catch what the back end things were. Like what, one was using one thing to look at their numbers and the other was using something else. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they use Google Analytics okay. versus something called like Comstat, uh, which well, is, then just have them all do the same one. Well, I think that's the, that's the point though is they intentionally don't use that. Everyone else uses this Comstat. Well, if everybody else uses the one, and they're just using their own thing. Then that shouldn't count. I, I mean, this I is. Think. I think that's why they're suing. I think yeah. that's the whole point here. So all right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it, it's just I, I. You got to be careful. I think you got to protect your reputation, but also. Right do the thing that makes you money at the same time. Like what's right. your highest and best use of time? What's, what's the most important stuff? And obviously this is very different than you know, running a business like you and I do. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I, it's, this isn't going away. I mean, CoStar is looking to make some waves here. I mean, I just don't, uh, you know, I'd love to see some data from homes.com. That was the first thing I asked and they just kept telling me about their billion dollar ad campaign. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode. You want to follow Sarah? She's on Instagram at Ty underscore Ty Time. You can follow me at Tom Tool 3 rd And if you liked what you heard, do us a favor. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to schedule a call with our team, you can do that with the link in the comments here. We'd love to talk to you about your real estate needs and how all this stuff affects you. We'll catch you next week on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM.